The Achaemenid Empire lasted 208 years. The Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great lasted 231. The Roman Republic lasted 233. Romanov Russia lasted 234. Today, the United States of America is 244 years old. What happens next? Where do we go from here? What do we build out of the ashes? Hello, I'm Kanaz Filan, and these are notes from the end of time. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to Notes from the End of Time. This is Kanaz Filan here with you for our 20th episode. As I said last week, today we're going to be talking about Thomas Mallory, the author of Le Mort d'Arthur. But first, before we do that, we're going to go in a little bit of the history of how we came up with the whole idea of Knights of the Round Table. And to start, we're going to go to the early days of the Holy Roman Empire, which was established by King Charlemagne. And Charlemagne wound up in control of an area that covered a great deal of today's Western Europe, the Low Countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and Germany. So that's a big tract of land. And what makes it interesting is Charlemagne had no standing army. There was nothing like the Roman army at this time. The king had his guard. You know, the king had some troops around him. But nobody was in charge of an entire army. In times of trouble, that meant you had to rely on raising troops. And how this was done was that Charlemagne and his successors would give tracts of land to minor nobles and the nobles would gain that land and they'd be able to gain all the profits that you can gain from it, from growing the food, from milling, what have you, in exchange for promising to raise troops and defend the realm should it prove necessary. And a lot of times these minor nobles were in control of territories which were pretty large themselves, so what they would do, because it was impossible for them to control the entire kingdom on their, their, on their own, would be to farm out those duties to other nobles to whom they provided land rights in exchange for being willing to raise troops. And the people who ran these smaller areas would farm out a bill at the land to other lesser nobles, landed knights, in exchange for them promising to raise troops. So it was almost like a multi-level marketing thing here. And to raise the food to keep themselves at fed, they would allow the land to be farmed by serfs who, in exchange for their labor and for other responsibilities, provided their lord with, f with the food, with the percentage of the profits, and they were serfs. And this system is known to us today as feudalism. And the warriors who did most of that fighting were called knights, or in French, chevaliers, and they would fight the battles. They required, they, knights were, being a knight was an enormously expensive undertaking. Horses were expensive, Armor is expensive, swords are expensive, and these knights who didn't have a liege lord to cover those expenses had to find a way to support themselves, and a lot of times what these unaffiliated knights did was pillage for a living. Just like the heathen Northmen who I mentioned last week, they would often go into churches because they were full of gold and silver and they were pretty easy targets. Those who were attached to sovereigns get involved in struggles between neighboring minor nobles and the people who bore the brunt of those quarrels were 
the serfs and the civilians. You're talking about a guy with a horse and a sword and training coming against people who at best were armed with staffs. And there was an awful lot of slaughter. There was an awful lot of sexual abuse and rape involved here. Knights had a really bad reputation in the early part of the Dark Ages. 989, they had to call a synod at Chalot in France, which declared that if you attack churches or the poor or the unarmed clergymen, you would get excommunicated. About 40 years later, there's a 1031 Council of Limoges where they came flat out and called God's anger upon all knights, upon their weapons, and their horse. These guys were essentially seen as violent, rampaging thugs. and you know, The church tried to tame them, but they really weren't having a lot of luck doing it. Then in 1095... Pope Urban II gets a message from the Byzantine Emperor Alexios I Komnenos. And now the Byzantines and the Latin Church, what we that what became Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism today, they have declared each other anathema. They don't get along. They're having theological disputes. There's a lot of distrust between them, but. Alexio sends a message saying, you know, we're being really hard pressed by the Seljuk Turks. We've lost a lot of Anatolia, what's called Asia Minor today, that is territory within the Republic of Turkey. Urban decided he was going to help. And one of the ways he decided he was going to help while he was at it was he was going to win the Holy Land back for the Christians. So in November of 1095, there's a council of Clermont. It's in Clermont-Ferrand in today's France. Urban is the son of an armigerous family. He has knights in his family. And he has a famous speech where he starts out by chastising knights for their misbehavior. And then he offers them a way to repent of their sins. From that speech, we have heard, most beloved brethren, and you have heard what we cannot recount without deep sorrow, how with great hurt and the suffering, dire sufferings, our Christian brothers, members in Christ, are scourged, oppressed, and injured in Jerusalem, in Antioch, and the other cities of the East. Your own blood brothers, your companions, your associates, for you are sons of the same Christ and the same church, are either subjected in their inherited homes to other masters, or are driven from them, or they come as beggars among us, or, which is far worse, they are flogged and exiled as slaves for sale in their own land. Christian blood redeemed by the blood of Christ has been shed, and Christian flesh akin to the flesh of Christ has been subjected to unspeakable degradation and servitude. Listen and learn. You, girt about with the badge of knighthood, are arrogant with great pride. You rage against your brothers and cut each other in pieces. This is not the true soldiery of Christ, which rends asunder the sheepfold of the Redeemer, the Holy Church has reserved a soldiery for herself to help her people, but you debase her wickedly to her hurt. Let us confess the truth whose heralds we ought to be. Truly, you are not holding to the way which leads to life. You, the oppressors of children, plunderers of widows, you, guilty of homicide, of sacrilege, robbers of another rights, you who await the pay of thieves for the shedding of Christian blood as vultures smell fetid corpses, so do you sense battles from afar and rush to them eagerly. Verily, this is the worst way, for it is utterly removed from God. If, forsooth, you wish to be mindful of your souls, either lay down the girdle of such knighthood or advance boldly as knights of Christ, and rush as quickly as you can to the defense of the Eastern Church. 
for she it is from whom the joys of your whole salvation have come forth, who poured into your mouths the milk of divine wisdom, who set before you the holy teachings of the Gospels. We say this, brethren, that you may restrain your murderous hands from the destruction of your brothers, and in behalf of your relatives in the faith, oppose yourself to the Gentiles. Under Jesus Christ, our leader, may you struggle for your Jerusalem in Christian battle line, most invincible line, even more successfully than did the sons of Jacob of old. Struggle that you may assail and drive out the Turks, more execrable than the Jebusites who are in this land, and may you deem it a beautiful thing to die for Christ in that city in which he died for us. But if it befall you to die this side of it, be sure that to have died on the way is of equal value. If Christ shall find you in his army, God pays with the same shilling, whether at the first or eleventh hour. You should shudder, brethren. You should shudder at raising a violent hand against Christians. It is less wicked to brandish your sword against Saracens. It is the only warfare that is righteous, for it is charity to risk your life for your brothers. And the ecstatic crowd listening, with tears running down their faces, yelled over and over, God wills it, or in Latin, Deus Volt. And that would become the rallying cry of the Crusades. Within a few months, over 6,000 knights and over 50,000 commoners sewed crosses onto their clothing and set off for the Holy Land. By 1099, they had reclaimed Jerusalem and reclaimed a lot of the land among, along the coast, and they'd set up you know, what we today call the Crusader States. And everybody saw this as an enormous sign of divine favor. Those who died along the way or who perished in battle were hailed as martyrs. Those who were there to triumph thanked God for it. They came back home, started seeing an enormous interest in relics which came from the Holy Land. But perhaps the biggest change was in Europe's attitude toward knights. Before this, they had been, at best, a necessary evil. Now there was this idea that a knight could be violent, a knight could do violence for a good cause, a knight could be a soldier for Christ, and th there was an idea that even the worst knight could redeem himself. Sometime in the early 12th century, after 1120, when his friend Hugh de Payen had founded a group called the Knights Templar, St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote a book called In Praise of the New Knighthood, or Liber Ad Milites Temple di Lode Nove Milite, where he says, It seems that a new knighthood has recently appeared upon the earth, and precisely in that part of it which the Orient from on high visited in the flesh, as he then troubled the princes of darkness in the strength of his mighty hand, so there he now wipes out their followers, the children of disbelief, scattering them by the hands of his mighty ones. Even now he brings about the redemption of his people, raising up again a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. This is, I say, a new kind of knighthood, and one unknown to the ages gone by. It ceaselessly wages a twofold war, both against flesh and blood, and against a spiritual army of evil in the heavens. When someone strongly resists a foe in the flesh, relying solely on the strength of the flesh, I would hardly remark it, since this is common enough. And when war is waged by spiritual strength against vices or demons, this too is nothing remarkable, praiseworthy as it is, for the world is full of monks. But when the one sees a man powerfully girding himself with both swords and nobly marking his belt, 
Who would not consider it worthy of all wonder, the more so since it has been hitherto unknown? He is truly a fearless knight and secure on every side, for his soul is protected by the armor of faith, just as his body is protected by armor of steel. He is thus doubly armed and need fear neither demons nor men. The knight of Christ, I say, may strike with confidence and die yet more confidently, for he serves Christ when he strikes and serves himself when he falls. Neither does he bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of the good. If he kills an evildoer, he is not a man-killer, but, if I may so put it, a killer of evil. He is evidently the avenger of Christ toward evildoers, and he is rightly considered a defender of Christians. Should he be killed himself, we know that he has not perished, but has come safely into port. When he inflicts death, it is to Christ's profit, and when he suffers death, it is for his own gain. The Christian glories in the death of the pagan, because Christ is glorified, while the death of the Christian gives occasion for the king to show his liberality in the rewarding of his knight. In the one case, the just shall rejoice when he sees justice done, and in the other man shall say, Truly there is a reward for the just. Truly it is God who judges this earth. These events at Jerusalem have shaken the world. The islands hearken, and the people from afar give ear. What could be more profitable and pleasant to behold than seeing such a multitude coming to reinforce the few? What, if not the twofold joy of seeing the conversion of these former impious rogues, sacrilegious thieves, murderers, perjurers, and adulterers? Indeed, it is both a happy and fitting thing that those who have so long fought against him should at last fight for him. Thus he recruits his soldiers among his foes, just as he once turned Saul the persecutor into Paul the preacher. Therefore I am not surprised that, as our Savior has affirmed, the court of heaven takes more joy in the conversion of one sinner than in the virtues of many just men who have no need of conversion. Certainly the conversion of so many sinners and evil doers will now do as much good as their former misdeeds did harm. Now I need to add here the disclaimer that not every crusader lived up to Bernard de Clairvaux's lofty ideals. In fact, many of them did not even come close to those lofty ideals. But the ideals themselves were still set into place. We now had the idea of a virtuous knight working for good. It's also worth noting that many of the crusaders who came on that first crusade and on subsequent crusades were Normans who would come in again out of Normandy, the land of the Northmen. They were descended from Vikings who had sworn fealty to the French king nearly two centuries earlier and who had accepted Christianity. When you look at many of the ideals of chivalry, you can see stuff from the Northman tradition. This is a lot of the ideals of chivalry, the idea that it's better to die a glorious death than to live as a coward. For example, the, fe the emphasis on fealty to one's liege lord all these things can be found in the Havamal, they can be found in the Norse sagas, but you also get this added influx from Christianity of the idea that you have a moral responsibility to protect the weak and the poor, and that you have a responsibility to do what is right and to fight, take up arms against that which is evil. I might go so far as to argue that much as the Grail legend baptized a lot of Celtic myths, the moral and ethical system we came to call chivalry baptized a lot of Norse and Germanic warrior codes of honor. I should also note that the, the crusader hold on Jerusalem was always tenuous, as I'd mentioned last week. By 1291, the crusaders were completely out of there. They lost Jerusalem in 1187. There was 
it was a doomed battle from the start. There were they never stayed there long enough. They they couldn't create enough of a force to keep out the Fatimids in Egypt, the Seljuk Turks to the north. They it was always a doomed battle, but again, it still gave us those ideals of knighthood. And now we get to Sir Thomas Mallory. While we're not absolutely certain on his birth date, most scholars today believe Thomas Mallory was born on or around 1415. And that means that the year Thomas Mallory was born was the year of a battle which many people mark as the end of chivalry. It took place in on a field in Agincourt, France. It was part of the Hundred Years' War, which actually was a 116-year war between England and France. And on the side of the French in this battle was the flower of French chivalry, the flower of French nobility. They're marvelously arrayed in their armor. They have heavy horses. They are all set to go to battle with the English but they don't, none of these knights are carrying bows because, according to codes of knighthood, missile weapons are cowardly. It, missile weapons allow you to kill your opponent at a distance. The only fair way to fight is to go sword to sword and head to head with your opponent. Now, on the English side, they don't have near so many knights, but they have a whole lot of commoners carrying longbows. And as they come rushing forward, they find themselves on their mighty steeds in their heavy plate armor, they find themselves hitting a hail of arrows. And the armor they were wearing might have been strong enough to withstand a hit from a longbow, but they had to put the visors down on their helmet lest they catch an arrow in the face, and this limits their vision. Also, their horses might have been wearing armor on their sides, but they typically weren't wearing armor over the whole body of the horse. That was just would be too heavy and it was too expensive. So when you have a big horse that's carrying an armored knight take an arrow to the flank, you now have a guided missile that's running headlong amongst your troops. Knights who fell off with their visors on, it was a swampy field, it was a cold rainy day, some of them drowned in their helmets, they couldn't get up out of the mud, and then they were taken down by English commoners who were carrying mallets and beat them to death, some of them had daggers and stabbed them through the visor hole, right through the eye and into the brain. Thousands of Frenchmen lost their lives that day. The English did not sustain really hard casualties at all. And it may or may not have been the end of chivalry, but it certainly was a, t a sign that the ideals of chivalry might not work very well against the battle practices of the early 15th century. Mallory came from an armigerous family. They were minor landed nobility in Warwickshire. His family manor was Newbold Manor, or as they called it colloquially, Finney Newbold, because his manor was surrounded at that time by swamps. Mallory had an uncle who was a hospitaller. That was a religious order of knighthood. He also had other relatives, cousins who we know, fought in the Hundred Years' War. It was traditional to knight somebody at around the age of 21. It was also traditional for them to spend some time as a squire working with or alongside other knights. So there is a very good chance that Mallory saw some combat in France. Our first public record of Thomas Mallory Knight appears in a May 23, 1439 public record. He was a witness to a land settlement that involved his cousin, Sir Philip Chetwynd. We know he was also at home in 1443 
Sir Thomas Mallory appears as a witness in the sale of a Warwickshire manor, but in October of 1443, Thomas Mallory and Eustace Burnaby, his brother-in-law, are accused of attacking a Thomas Smythe and stealing 40 pounds worth of goods. Now, that case never went to trial, and it does seem to have had a huge impact on Mallory's social standing because early in 1445, Mallory, like his father, was elected to Parliament as a representative of War Warwickshire. When the 1445 term of Parliament ended and Thomas Mallory was back at home, a woman named Catherine Pato, I believe she was a widow, filed a complaint that Mallory had stolen oxen from her estate at Sibertoft and sheep from her estate at Camden. And it's worth noting that at the time, England was in the midst of an economic depression that historians call the Great Slump. At this point, the war between England and France had been going on for generations, and we all know wars are expensive. There was also the problem that King Henry VI was a rather lavish spender. In 1449, royal income was £5,000 a year, and royal expenditures were £24,000 a year. According to a petition from the House of Commons, the throne was in debt for £372,000. That's a huge sum. The, the English had lost territory in France, and that meant a loss of markets for English clothes. There were a lot of English nobles who relied on their continental holdings for money. There was also a decline in agricultural prices. That meant a lot of peasants abandoned their farms because they could no longer support themselves and headed into the towns and cities. And this cut into the income of the rental income for the landed gentry and the very minor nobility, which is where a Thomas Mallory would come in. Remember, as I told you, being a knight was an expensive task, and when knights were pressed for funds, they frequently resorted to robbery or pillaging. We know that Thomas Mallory was returned to Parliament in 1450, and once again, when he got back home from Parliament on May 23rd, Mallory and several accomplices raided the home of Hugh Smith and raped Hugh Smith's wife, Margaret, then a week later, Mallory strong-armed a hundred shillings from Margaret King and William Hale before returning to London for another session of Parliament. Upon returning home on August 6, he came back to Smith's house, raped Margaret again, carried off 40 pounds worth of goods, and on August 31st extorted 20 shillings by threats of violence from John Milner. In March of 1451, Mallory and 19 of his henchmen were charged with a January assassination attempt on the Duke of Buckingham. That summer, Mallory and five accomplices stole seven cows, two calves, 335 sheep, and a cart from a Coswald estate. And finally, Buckingham got together 60 armed men and set out to bring Mallory to justice. Mallory responds by raiding Buckingham's Park at Calyadon, and there he kills six deer and did 5,000 pounds sterling worth of damage. To our American listeners, in 2020 dollars, that Mallory did $6.35 million worth of damage to Buckingham's estate. In July of 1451, Buckingham and his men finally caught up with Mallory at Newbold Revel, the ancestral manor. The day after they turn him over to the sheriff, Mallory jumps out a window, swims a moat, and escapes. The following night, July 28, 1451, Mallory and ten accomplices launch a raid on a monastery, Coombe Abbey, they steal 86 pounds worth of art and money, 
The next night, Mallory comes back with over 100 men, steals another 40 pounds, and beats the abbot with a stick. Sometime after this, he's captured yet again, and on January 27, 1452, Thomas Mallory's confined to prison. And the first question that comes to mind is, what took him so long? We have... Thomas Mallory's first recorded misdeeds happen in 1443 and 44, and it's not until 1452 that they finally put him in prison. And one advantage which Mallory had is having a powerful liege lord gave you a certain amount of leeway into what sort of bad behavior you were allowed to get away with. Mallory was knighted by the Duke of Warwick, who was one of the most powerful men in England. Unfortunately, the Duke of Warwick was not on the best terms with Henry VI. Henry VI, by all accounts, was a very pious man. He was a very well-meaning king. He said his prayers, but he was not a strong-willed king. He wanted very much to be loved, but he never really understood that a a monarch has to be feared as well, and he never really grasped how to hold power and keep power. One of Henry VI's childhood friends, Henry Beauchamp, the Earl of Warwick, remained close to Henry. He got numerous land grants from the king. In 1445, he was given a dukedom. And that was all very nice, except many of the lands which Henry VI granted to the Earl of Warwick belonged originally to Henry Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham. Now, you will remember the straw that finally broke the camel's back with Mallory's bad behavior, was an attack on the Duke of Buckingham. They finally got him locked up. Warwick was able to pull some strings. In October 1452, he was granted bail. He returns home to Newbold Manor. Not long after coming back, he's accused of stealing four oxen from Lady Pato's Sebertoft Manor. And... This is, again, this is exactly the kind of behavior that people complained about in the pre-Crusade era nights. Mallory was short on funds. Jail at that time was an expensive prospect. Mallory had enough money. He wasn't winding up in the noisome dungeons. He was able to supply, had supplied food for himself, but he w- it was costly, and he wasn't there to watch his lands to collect the rents. He was in debt, and so he went as soon as he got back. He needs to raise money, so he did what he did best, steal cattle. That, however, resulted in Mallory's bail being revoked. By the summer of 1453, he was back in prison. While Mallory was incarcerated again... We had the battle which marked the end of the Hundred Years' War. Now, some people will tell you that chivalry ended at Agen Court. Other people date the end of chivalry to the Battle of Castellon. At Agen Court, you had the flower of French nobility running headlong into English arrows. At Castellon, you have English troops led by Sir John Talbot. He's a man who's had many successes in war. He's a dashing, valiant soldier. He was nicknamed the English Achilles. Talbot charges with his troops towards a fortified encampment and discovers only too late that the encampments had around 300 cannons. Now, being fired upon with arrows sucks. Catching a cannonball sucks a lot worse. It was a bloody, complete rout. When Henry VI was told of this, now Henry was a squeamish man. He hated the sight of blood. He did not even like the sight of naked bodies. He had a lot of hang-ups. 
He was never the most stable guy. When they described the slaughter at Castellan, Henry fell into a catatonic stupor. They could the best doctors in England couldn't wake him up. They tried emetics, they tried bloodletting, hot baths, leeches. He just refused to come out of his shell. Now, during Henry's reign, a war-torn country was ruled by a weak and ineffectual monarch. Now we have a defeated and near-bankrupt country that's under the rule of a mad king. And what do you do when the king goes mad? Well, the king's court was splitting into two different factions. One group favored Queen Margaret of Anjou, Henry's wife, and the infant prince Edward of Lancaster. The other favored the Lord Protector Richard of York. He's been appointed to rule during King Henry's incapacity. Now, Henry had screwed Buckingham over on the land and gave it to Warwick, but Buckingham supported Lancaster. Warwick supported the Duke. Warwick, who is Henry VI's childhood friend, supported the Duke of York. He gets Thomas Mallory sprung from prison yet again in May 50, 1454. He knows a civil war was brewing and he figures a man of Mallory's somewhat distasteful talents might just prove useful when this happens. Unfortunately, Mallory did not co cooperate with the conditions of his release. By October, he had been imprisoned in Essex for horse theft and burglary, and he was back at the king's bench and back in prison when Henry VI finally comes out of his stupor. February 1455, King Henry's dismissed York as the Lord Protector, and all of York's supporters who he's put in gov who he'd put in government while the king was catatonic have now been replaced with loyal Lancastrians. The Civil War starts up. The York wins the first battle of Battle of St. Albans. Lancaster forces are represented, by the way, with red roses, and York's forces are represented with white roses. This is the beginning of a period which is known in English history as the Wars of the Roses. Henry's in charge. Fall of France means there's no money to pay soldiers, so at this point, you've now got a bunch of hungry troops who are have waiting for their wages. They're happy to fight for anybody who will pay them cash in hand. There are also a lot of other upstart knights that are figuring they could improve their station by throwing in with the winning party. And Warwick no longer has the pull to get Mallory out of prison, nor after his last antic, he may well not have a particular desire to. And the Wars of the Roses were basically a hard-fought struggle for power. Coats were turned, sides were switched, promises were broken. Lancastrians at the Battle of Bloor Heath, 500 Lancastrian troops suddenly attacked their fellow soldiers and then threw in with York. Then a few weeks later at Ludlow Bridge, Yorkist troops were routed after Andrew Trollope and his 600 men suddenly defected to Lancaster. Finally, in 1460, King Henry is captured at Northampton. Lord Grey of Ruthven orders his men to lay down their arms and let the Yorkist troops pass. So now King Henry is in captivity. Then in December, Richard, Duke of York, is killed at Wakefield after he's led into a Lancastrian ambush. Things are not looking good for the Yorkists at the end of 1460, but by April 1461, King Queen Margaret and Prince Edward are hiding in Scotland. Edward of York, Richard's son, is crowned King Edward IV. Sometime that year, Thomas Mallory is released from prison. He comes back to London in October of 1462, and he receives a pardon for his misdeeds. And this time, Thomas Mallory appears to have learned his lesson. 
He was also getting a little older at this point. He's getting uh, nearly 50 years old. He There's no more records of Mallory getting involved in raiding, robbing, pillaging, what have you. We, we have no idea of what exactly he did, but chances are he spent at least some time reading the very popular at this time Arthurian tales and ballads. There was material out there in Middle English. There's Leomond's Blute that's written in Middle English. It's from Brut Brutus, who is the founder of Britain, according to this story. That's a translation of a French poem called Roman de Brut. He may have read Geoffrey of Monmouth's Latin History of the Kings of Britain. You know, he may have read the Stanzaic Mort Arthur, the alliterative Mort Arthur, and he may have even read some of the French courtly poems like Cléton de Troyes in the original, though when he uses French in his manuscript, he was probably reading the French book very slowly and with some difficulty. We have a better idea of what Richard Neville, Lord Warwick, who had gotten Mallory out of this scrape, was doing at this time. He had helped put Edward IV on the throne. He was invaluable. He had earned the nickname the Kingmaker. He is spending time trying to pacify Lancastrian rebels in northern England. And, but he discovers that Edward is a bit difficult to manage. He tried to negotiate a marriage between Edward and a woman named Bona. She's the sister-in-law of Francis King Louis XI. That would guarantee continuing peace between England and France. That would also result in a lot of treaties, which would be very helpful for keeping Edward on the throne. But after he makes these arrangements and he comes home, he discovers that Edward has secretly married Elizabeth Woodville, who everybody agrees is beautiful, but she's a middle-class woman. Her family doesn't hold much land. They've got no political connections. Warwick is really offended by this. In 1466, he has an associate accuse Elizabeth's mother which would be a, an indirect accusation of the new queen of casting witchcraft upon the king, of putting a love spell against him. Those charges are dismissed early in 1467. But at this point, Warwick has lost all favor with the court and with the king he put on the throne. And so he starts shifting over to the Lancastrian cause, Warwick is still powerful enough that Edward doesn't want to make a direct attack on him, but Edward knows full well what Th Sir Thomas Mallory is capable of. There are no charges brought against Mallory this time, but this being 15th century England, if the king wants you locked up in the tower, you get locked up in the tower. And so in 1467, late in 1467, we see Thomas Mallory return to, the, return to prison and placed in the Tower of London alongside King Henry, who was captured in 1465. As before, Mallory's confinement wasn't especially onerous. He had some access to books, and so to while away the time during yet another stretch of captivity, he starts writing down a prose rendition of all the stories that he's collected on the Arthurian legend, and he calls this the whole book of King Arthur and of his noble Knigets of the Round Table. The earlier French sources that he worked with, which had been compiled in the 13th century during the Golden Age of Chivalry, actually the waning days of the Golden Age of Chivalry, had been compiled by monks and scribes. There's a lot of speculation. They were Cistercian monks that would have been members of the order, which was founded by Bernard of Clairvaux, who, who I mentioned earlier, they were trying to present exemplary guides for how knights should behave. Mallory had, unlike those monks, direct experience of what combat is like, 
and he knew what it was to be one of those bad nights because he had been a bad night. Mallory compiles his tales. He gets rid of a lot of the moralizing. It's much more a direct story of the actions at hand. After seeing what had happened with Edward and Elizabeth Woodville, he knew all too well the perils of a lord thinking with his big, with his little head instead of his big one. And so he had a certain sympathy for the story of Lancelot and Guinevere. It's easy to speculate that at some point during his time in the tower, he actually had a chance to speak with the Mad King. He certainly was aware that Henry was incarcerated alongside him. He has... A lot of sympathy for King Arthur, who in Mallory's version is a good man. He's a good warrior, but he doesn't really do a lot to stop the affair between Lancelot and Guinevere. He's got that kind of dithering quality which Henry VI had. And when Lancelot's affair with Guinevere splits the court apart and then the ro- the round table is divided into t- into warring factions with some people siding with Gawain and some people siding with Lancelot after Guinevere is condemned to death. He also recounts the tale of the quest for the Holy Grail and he notes that the round table most of the knights that go out searching for the grail never see it. Only a few of them come back, and they're generally in really poor shape. The ones who see the grail wind up either wind up dead. Only one of them, Sir Bors, actually manages to make it back. But yet, at the same time, He recognizes that for all of its costs, for all of the bloodshed and all of the sorrow and misery that it brings, that the grail is still something worth seeking out. He understands what it's like to be Lancelot standing outside the chapel door, somebody who wants to desperately to attain to the grail, somebody who wants desperately to be forgiven of his sins, but somebody who cannot resist falling again and again into sin. And Mallory's skill for crafting these beautiful dream images, which were drawn from all of these sources, giving us this ideal world of chivalry, is well known he gets less credit for the really keen psychological insights he had and the hard-won knowledge he had of just what it means to be a knight, just what it means to seek for the good and fail, and what it means to fall into evil. He knew that he knew from the before he started the book that Camelot was always doomed to fail, that Arthur's realm was always going to end with Mordred striking him with the fatal wound. He knew that, but yet he still thought Arthur's story worth telling. He still found inspiration in Arthur's story, even if it ends in tragedy, not triumph. When he finishes the book, sometime in 1469, he ends it with a note to please pray for me, Thomas Mallory, the night prisoner. He may or may not have been released, but we know before his death, but we know that in in March of 1471, Thomas Mallory dies and is buried. About 14 years later, a man named William Caxton, who had just imported one of those newfangled inventions from Germany called a printing press, releases the whole book of the, the whole book of the Knights of King Arthur. He gives it the title of the last of the eight books within the story. He calls it La Mort d'Arthur, and it 
just becomes an enormous bestseller. People couldn't get enough of Mallory. He goes out of fashion briefly for about 100 years or so, about 200 years. You don't hear as much of Mallory as you start getting the age of the classicists. You even see in Spain, you see Miguel Cervantes write a really loving satire of chivalry, which is, of course, Don Quixote. But it comes back, particularly in the Victorian era, like Lord Tennyson releasing Idols of the King. The pre-Raphaelites were hugely inspired by La Morte d'Arthur. Today, it's become a classic again. You see from musicals like Camelot, which was which became a bestseller in the United States right after the death of the Kennedy assassination. Again, at times when we're struggling, when everything seems to be falling apart, Mallory understood that we need that idealized past. We need those stories of what could have been, even though we know it never was and it never will be. It gives us that light, that inspiration. It shows us what we might be. It shows us what we might have been. And that inspiration is something we need so desperately today. When our world is falling apart, when they're tearing down our heroes, when they're telling us there's nothing better than whatever pleasures we can grab during our short time above the dirt, we need to be reminded that there is something better. There can be something better. Maybe we will never reach it, but it's still important for us to go towards Maybe Sir Thomas Mallory never found the grail, but yet he was able to show us the way. And maybe if we look for the grail, our failure can be as noble as his. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, thank you for listening. This is Kanaz File, and you have been here for Notes for the End of Time, our 20th episode. Thank you again for tuning in, and may God bless us each and every one.